Thank you so much all for coming and thank you Stephanie for the introduction as well as the invitation to speak. Uh, Stephanie mentioned it is indeed a big topic, uh, but we have very significant leaders in the field to speak about this big topic. So our roundtable is titled Navigating Multipolarity, What Defines Institutional Practice in a World with Many Centers. As Stephanie mentioned, my name is Christopher Ho and I will be today's moderator. It's my honor to converse with our distinguished guests hailing from near and far, uh, Nikita from Guangzhou, Philip from Beijing, uh, as also Shanghai, uh, Aaron from London, I have from uh, just outside Riyadh, and Mami from Tokyo. Uh, so to our esteemed panelists, welcome. So that your home cities stretch from one end to the other of Eurasia testifies, I think, to the multipolarity in our roundtable's title. The art world does seem to have many gravitational centers. Yet, as we gather here in Hong Kong, Asia's self-styled world city, few can deny that the last three years have proved difficult for physical crossings, if not intellectual exchange. So my opening question to you all is this. How has the hardening of national boundaries altered your view of global contemporary art, which now seems somewhat quaint a term, and how have your respective institutions been altered in turn? And this is to uh, anyone who would like to uh, pick up on this question. Um, I'll take it. Um, so again, I'm Aaron Cesar from Delfina Foundation in London. Um, my images are going to come up at some point on the screen, so they will illustrate some of the things that I'm about to say about the last uh, really 15 years of being director at Delfina Foundation and some of the challenges over the last three years, as it were. Um, obviously, the last three years have been kind of um, marked by the global pandemic, um, the singular event that kept us, many of us, apart. And so first of all, it was great to be back in Hong Kong. Um, it was great to see my <laughs> colleagues, particularly Mammy, who I haven't seen in, in, in three years, and so many of our kind of artists who have been in residence with us at Delfina Foundation and our patrons. Um, the images are, are up here now that I'm, I'm able to, to, to share with you. Um, you saw an image earlier of our home, the home of Delfina Foundation. We are located um, in the heart of uh, a city, near the seat of power in London. We are located in a capital that once was the capital of one of the world's largest empires, in a country that once was part of the European Union. In the last three years, we have experienced a pandemic, but in the UK, we've also been suffering the aftermaths of Brexit. And so we consider at Delfina Foundation kind of our kind of role and responsibility being located in kind of the center of London you know, again, near the seat of power, and how we share this center with artists from all over the world. And we were first set up in 2007, we had a very particular focus on exchange with the Middle East and North Africa. And this was at a time when that region was um, really um, traumatized by the quote unquote war on terror, by George Bush's kind of them and us language that came from the period of 9-11 that went through the next 10 years. And so Delfina Foundation was set up to, at first, to kind of create international exchange and to also really rethink kind of the, the, the relationship between art and society and for a region in the Middle East to try and give a different type of voice and presence of those artists on the international stage. And there are kind of many practitioners who today um, have become um, quite kind of well known who started their, 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 their kind of careers at Delfina Foundation kind of in London from the Middle East and North Africa. But it was very complicated also working with a very specific region, a region that had many different centers, kind of as we're kind of discussing today, and also us being in London, kind of this, again, this global quote unquote center, supposedly center, um, you know, that has, you know, had a very difficult colonial history. Um, with the Middle East and North Africa itself, I have to say. Um, 
but nonetheless, I wanted to kind of just say that what we began to do um, as an organization is rethink the whole notion of geography and centers and to question kind of the role of, uh, of kind of cultural exchange and the, the complications when it's imbalanced between them and us, when cultural exchange is based around differences rather than commonalities. So we shifted our work as an organization to focus more thematically um, on, on practice rather than place, on common ideas and shared affinities um, rather than kind of cultural differences. And so I'm gonna get to the last three years. I'm, I'm coming to the last three years, Chris. Uh, in a that I just wanted to... <laughs> a lot has happened. To get to the last three minutes, I gotta go through, a, I gotta pour out a lot of like emotion and pain and suffering to kind of get there, you know, right? Um, this is my therapeutic session. This is our self-care we talked about in the pandemic being made very public. Um, so we, in like 2014, we kind of re, kind of like thought our own programming um, to focus on um, common themes and issues that artists are experiencing. Um, and one of which was um, the politics of food. Um, which has become quite renowned for in terms of supporting practitioners who have a practice that's very much locally situated, but has a strength in its determination, in its development as a collective effort. So, right, so using London, our center, as a meeting point, as we like to call like a third space. So the fact that we are in the center, but we're not, we don't consider ourselves to be part of the, the machinery and the power making or, or no, power assumption that the UK has, which led to the Brexit vote. Um, we consider ourselves to be more of a, a third space where we offer a platform for artists to come together, to share ideas, to find solidarity, to kind of to, uh, join forces in terms of rethinking kind of the relationship between art and society. So I'm pushing now to the last three years. In a sense that um, when in the last kind of three year period, we have been still kind of suffering the aftermath um, of Brexit. Well, I don't say aftermath. It's an ongoing and very painful process that has been wrapped into the pandemic. And sometimes the impact of Brexit has been hidden within the pandemic. So as an institution, we've been trying to find ways to kind of respond to that, to use our place in the center as a place where we can bring together artists and practitioners to kind of question the, the idea of, of, or the issues around nationalism and racism. We've done that through a series of programs like Collecting as Practice, another one, another one of our thematic programs that's looked at issues around restitution, return, um, and um, the huge amount of colonial artifacts that UK institutions have, and, um, and how, and what responsibilities they have to kind of, uh, to the communities that originally possessed and owned and, and cared for these objects. Um, but within the politics of food, I'm gonna go back to that one. I mean, the last three years, we really want to focus on kind of the issues that related to the climate emergency and rethinking how we support artists as they are locally situated. Um, so one of the images that were shown earlier was um, images from a project that was developed in the Congo um, through our politics of food residency. And we've been kind of really rethinking how do we kind of really dis decentralize even our work that's based in London and support artists more in situ where they're located um, in different centers around the world, even places that would be a non center. Because in the case of the Congo, this is a community, community not even in the capital city, um, that was undergoing um, um, uh, a very particular, I don't want to go into all the details, very specific situation. But the, the point of what I want to say is that we were supporting the artists directly on the ground in the Congo and also supporting them through a residency in London to kind of join kind of ideas that could really kind of remap and rethink kind of the problems that were located there. Okay, that was an amazing um, uh, answer, Aaron, and also a testament to how much you've been doing in the past uh, three years and since Delphinus founding in 2007. We will get back to this idea of the politics of food and say alternative ways of mapping out the world but for now, two things uh, strike me about your response. The first is your characterization of Delphina as a third space, third country. Um, I appreciate that because in some ways that breaks our very, uh, ha our habit of structuring the world in terms of polarities, even if it's multipolar or not. The second is you described in a way your engagement with the Middle East and North Africa as third country, Delfina, 
to Middle East and North Africa versus, say, someone like former President Bush, us versus them, right? Which in some ways uh, is an antagonistic relationship. So I wanna open up this question um, to, uh, um, actually to Aya, because you, know, you, you are indeed in, in, in the Middle East, uh, and uh, thinking about ways that uh, you have responded to, I suppose, what can only be called sometimes projections onto uh, Saudi Arabia or, or you know, the region uh, from the rest of the world, and how might you, you respond to these in, in, with the, the foundation and the work you do there? Thanks, Chris. Aaron, that was a really nice answer, by the way. <laughs> Actually, just to, 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 to continue what Aaron was saying, in terms of the way that Delphine has been positioned with Saudi Arabia, uh, with the artists, Delphine has always been the place that artists go to at the very beginning, especially when they want to find a comfortable place to start in their career, seek support, um, uh, you know, um, kind of experiment with their practice, etc. Delphina was always the place that opened their opened its arms to these artists, and I feel like a lot of our super established Saudi artists um, learned so much um, from 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 Delphina and the team, honestly. So. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, and I feel like, in terms of what, like, like you said, Chris, projections. I, I don't, I don't see it that way. Um, I, I think we do. I, we're kind of much more focused on the practice or the arts, you know, in, in, in general. So I think, in terms of. I don't know, discussing uh, specific um, or having specific conversations, I think it's always done through the art narrative. And I think it's always through specific works or asking questions or seeking you know, knowledge or, or experimenting. Or, um, and I think as, the, as a foundation, we try as much as we can with a lot of our artists, our curators, to um, engage and I think you know, make it more outward. So I think there is like a there's like always a, a conversation when it comes to um, um, interacting with different, with different, um, you know. Uh, and I think in terms of the arts as well, in, in as a foundation, what we've been trying to do, and I've, we've we've only done you know one, two biennials now, but the first biennial is the first one that kind of we did this cross fertilization. So we we with um, from from the show that Phil and and the team curated. Um, there were like works that were chosen to be part of another another biennial that was in a different context, different theme, different concept, but kind of also tackled a specific um, a conversation that I think opens up different doors to to, to different kind of. So so I think that's that's the way we kind of always try to to focus on. And I think this is, I mean, Phil, if you would love to, uh, if you'd like to respond. Uh, so the first uh, biennial uh, I had the, that I was ref referring to is, is uh, uh, Feeling the Stones uh, from 2022. One. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, so um, I mean, f by way of backstory, people may know UCCA, I mean, in, in the Hong Kong context. Uh, it's an institution that was founded a few months before Beijing hosted its first Olympics at its kind of moment of maximum openness and outward curiosity and, and external excitement around you know, where China was at the moment perceived to be going, um, which, which were things that were, came, came under serious questioning in the last three years specifically. Um, and that's a whole other conversation that I imagine we'll have, have time for. How you know going from this idea of being an institution founded by a Belgian in in Beijing to uh, being an institution very much grounded in it, its context, which is maybe not as cosmopolitan as it once was, in or not cosmopolitan maybe in different ways. Um, w one major thing for UCCA during these three years was this involvement with the Dari Biennale in, in Saudi Arabia. I mean, this was one of the major projects that that I undertook and undertook with a major team. Patrick uh, Ryan is, is in the audience who edited the catalog. Um, Shishuan Luan, another one of our curators. So it was this, of course, which is on, uh, <laughs> and the whole DBF team. Um, but it was, um, 
it was this incredibly deep and serious engagement, albeit remote. I mean, we curated a biennial essentially over Zoom, uh, was doing studio visits, and ultimately coming up with this formulation of feeling the stones, which comes from Deng Xiaoping, you know, the idea of crossing the river by feeling the stones. Um, this idea of iterative, exploratory change and uh, development that was a metaphor for societies in transition, but also I think for artistic practice and creation in, in a lot of other ways. And we always had this idea that there might be something in this experience of the Chinese avant-garde, which Nikita's slides bring up in such a beautiful way, its process of globalization and emergence throughout the 80s and 90s that could be that could speak to uh, this another process happening in the 2010s and 2020s in, in Saudi, uh, that, that, that those were similar moments of arrival, um, of, of embrace, of excitement, um, of, of uncertainty and ambiguity. And it, can one create a conversation you know, between these two, but also that radiates out in all kinds of other directions? And like we see this, um, I mean, for me, th that's the juxtaposition, this piece by Richard Long, which appeared in 1989 uh, at Magician de la Terre in this very kind of overdetermined dialogue with an with a Aboriginal work that was on the floor below it, um, recreated 35 years later in Diria using local mud, um, in dialogue with a piece by a senior female Saudi artist, Maha Malou, uh, which, which will pop up again, I'm sure, as well, which is a world map. There we go, <laughs> made of tapes that uh, that had once, um, you know, transmitted Friday sermons around the Arab world. Um, so, I guess all to say, there are lots of dialogues to be had and to be fostered and to be created. And, and I think, uh, if anything, these past years have given us a new humility and a new intentionality about how we might go about that. Well, I appreciate that all three responses so far have focused specifically on artistic processes. So, Aaron, you spoke about, um, in some ways, uh, uh, focusing on, on what an artist does in, in his or her or their studio. Uh, Aya, you also mentioned it's not about projections or these kind of macro geopolitical narratives so much as supporting the artists. Um, and uh, Phil, uh, I think the title of your uh, Biennale, you know, um, uh, Feeling the Stones is also, as you said, that iterative process that's very much like uh, an artist's process in, in their studio. So in some ways, I wonder if uh, artistic processes are a um, alternative term or an antidote to these macro uh, structures that we use to view the world, like us versus them, China versus the US, uh, you know, um, third, first world, so on and so forth. Um, I wonder, uh, Nikita, uh, Mami, I, I wonder what you, you think. Mami, I know that you've been working also with uh, this idea of school curriculums, uh, which, which seems very different, right, than talking about geopolitics. Thank you. Yeah, maybe um, I'll talk about the slides that I was showing. Um, I was uh, sort of a COVID director. I was appointed a director in 2020, January, and then February COVID came. So uh, I was trying to fly on and then have to come back again. But uh, I was doing uh, the few shows in the last three years and then also I did the IT Trainale 2022 completely under COVID. So uh, I think this COVID experience made us think that uh, how to made us probably make more effort. How can we connect globally uh, without traveling? And, um, but the slide that I was showing is that since the Mori Art Museum is celebrating 20th anniversary later this year, so uh, the Mori Art Museum in Tokyo uh, opened in 2003 
as a part of the larger urban development called the uh, Roppongi Hills, so which is quite a unique model, I think, as a private museum. Normally, private museums start from the owner's private collection to be shown to the public. But the Mori Art Museum started as, as a sort of an energy center for the new urban development and where um, changing contemporary exhibition will generate the energy to to really sort of conceptualize where we are and how the whole city uh, navigates the, the future. So uh, it's a quite unique model. And in thinking about this 20th anniversary, which also my 20th anniversary was a museum, I just could not believe that I, I worked for the one institution for 20 years, but also one leg was always somewhere else. So <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> and then I was thinking really about uh, uh, what, is, what do we mean by international or global? Or what do we mean by contemporary? Because the uh, contemporaneity and then also international had been our sort of topic for the museum since the beginning. And uh, what do you mean by that? And, uh, but also um, these uh, culturally, regionally, socially specific art has been dominating or forefronted all around the world for at all these different biennales. Then I started to think, what if we could think of contemporary art as not as a one subject of the school class, but the, if I could, th we could think of a contemporary art as more sort of a holistic view of the world through uh, mathematics and science and social studies and everything. So this world classroom, which is opening in April, uh, 19th at the Moriart Museum is dividing exhibition into school subjects. So it starts from uh, literature and language, social studies, philosophy, uh, mathematics, science, and uh, music, physical education, and uh, transdisciplinary class. So it's, it was infinite fun to think about artworks through different school subjects and then start from diversity when you look at the languages and sociology and philosophy you see the, the differences in diversity but when it comes to mathematics and science that is the different ways of seeing the world by trying to seek for the truth or universality of this globe beyond uh, national boundaries. And then uh, you can also try to sort of analyze what artists are doing, referring to so many different uh, entry points. So uh, Hegyu Yan and Jakob Kierkegaard and Akira Takayama is coming for the transdisciplinary section. And uh, also we started to count how many people visited the Mori Art Museum and how many artists we showed. So uh, we are making this a world map of uh, uh, 1,600 artists who participated in our museum in the last 20 years. So, uh, of course, more from Asia and more, uh, more from Europe, but then you can see where we have to work on more. But also, curatorial model I also changed during the COVID time, that this is all curators' project. So normally in a museum, one curator has your own project, and the next curator work on the next project. But I decided to work uh, on the programming by conversing among everyone, what do we need to be doing at the moment? Then uh, seven curators discuss uh, from different perspective so that uh, I don't believe, no, I no longer believe, for instance, my own perspective as global enough so that always it's far more interesting to start something from multiple eyes. And for uh, IT Triennale also, I worked with nine curatorial advisors from different parts of the world. So that uh, I throw this idea uh, still alive from Onkawara, then uh, everyone kind of filled in the what artists and what uh, works could be fit in the context. So uh, yeah, I think uh, this uh, topic for today, um, uh, multipolarity, had been always my way of seeing the world, and uh, contemporary art itself is for all of us to see the world from different perspective.
thank you, Chris, for uh, sparing me as the last person <laughs> to speak so I can kind of structure my thoughts and also respond. I mean, I resonate so much with all of what you said. Um, and uh, also because uh, I see a lot of new friends, new public today, so maybe uh, I will give a brief introduction of Times Museum. So, um, so uh, actually Times Museum emerged around the same time of UCCA, uh, end of uh, uh, the museum officially opened to the public end of 2010, and I started to work there as the curator. So I'm also the last person to talk about running an institution here, and uh, yeah, amongst the panelists today, because I always think of myself as uh, maybe um, uh, as a curator who curate interdependency in the evolving network of Times Museum uh, through the program, through the communities uh, that we bridge and connect over the past decade. Um, so, uh, um, and also structurally, physically, uh, Times Museum uh, is a little bit similar to Mori because we situated on top of an 18th floor residential building. And of course, I also miss biennials a lot. <laughs> That's <laughs> the past three years that, as you may all know, that, uh, um, that in mainland it's impossible for us to travel because Times Museum also funded a parallel institution in Berlin in 2018. So uh, prior to 2019, I also used to probably travel in between Guangzhou and Berlin every two months. Um, but this is actually today or in the past few days, uh, it's uh, the first time I reconnect with a lot of friends, in, uh, maybe in the public today, but also with peers. Um, then um, then the, the history of Times Museum, Times Museum is located in Guangzhou, but it's almost, uh, it's a very particular, I think, document, a very particular moment of um, the opening up of uh, Po River Delta used to call, the region used to call the Po River Delta. Now it's renamed as the Greater Bay Area. And the legacy of how uh, Po River Delta was the frontier of opening up policy and a massive uh, process and uh, rapid process of urbanization. So uh, when uh, Ram Kuhas came to uh, the region and did a research with a team of Harvard Design School uh, students in 1996 and then published this book called The Great Leap Forward. Um, and then, uh, and also uh, Times Museum was uh, resulted from the second Guangzhou Triennial um, that uh, think of uh, uh, the Po River Delta as uh, a zone of experiment of uh, avant-garde, of contemporary art, but also of different kind of uh, cultural scenes. But uh, since I took this position of curating a kind of evolving network of mu a Times Museum, I also need to respond to, um, first, it's a kind of elite, el elitist formation of the region, because the name of from Po River Delta to the Greater Bay Area was a kind of socio-economic formation from like a top-down policy from the state. And then of course, Ram Kuhas research uh, defined the region as a uh, kind of materialized, this uh, rapid but almost violent process of uh, urbanization and modernization uh, in China. Um, and But what had been missing was uh, a kind of bottom-up uh, perspective, a decentralized perspective. So over the past 10 years, uh, Times Museum has been focusing on, uh, of course, a lot of, maybe from the outside, people notice more or less our exhibition program uh, that tend to uh, narrate a kind of regional uh, particularity of the region uh, in connection with a bigger uh, a plural worldview. But that's also why our public or our young audience uh, become a very close part of our community because I think we speak to a generation of young people that grew up from um, this uh, very particular atmosphere, uh, the post-2000. And, um, and then um, after this 10 years of running the museum, now we uh, moved to the past three years. Of course, we also went through, uh, as Aaron mentioned, the pain and struggle of the pandemic and 
for us, it's also after uh, 2020, Wuhan's outbreak, our team gathered to together to talk about and think about maybe a different kind of, maybe there need to be a different museum paradigm. Uh, and my main concern at that time was like whether our public will go back, will come back to the museum, or do they really miss this intimacy of having contact with artworks in a physical space? Because young public in China, you know, they get so used to different kind of interface. So our contact with the wall or this uh, plurality of the wall is only through the internet or social media. Do people really miss the complexity of reality? Uh, and if we are the kind of institution that keep or continue to uh, investigate or explore such complex worldview, uh, will we lose our public or audience after the pandemic? So that was uh, a major question. The other one is like, uh, is it really ethical to continue producing big scale exhibition that might be anti-ecological? Is it even, I mean, ethical in a way to think of our way of traveling and connecting? Um, so then, um, of course, after 2020, we continue to produce exhibition with like long distance, like Zoom curating kind of format. Uh, and then, of course, in 2020, some of you may know that economic downturn, and then uh, this year we have to temporarily shut down our exhibition program because the lack of funding and also the, the challenges of the real estate industry. We are also a privately funded museum. So we shift to a very different model, focusing on research and process, and we initiated this uh, collective inquiry that you may, uh, you may see from my slide called uh, the three contested sites to look back to the moment of the 90s, that very particular moment, a different kind of globality. What does that mean? Uh, not just for the artist community, but also for a younger public that really need hope. So I probably will end my <laughs> answer for this session. Here. That was incredible. And I, two things I think we should ask your colleagues on stage that you brought up. Uh, you talked about exploring different museum paradigms motivated by the past three years. And you also asked, are big scaled exhibitions still the way forward? These are questions that you've been working on at the Times Museum. I wonder what your colleagues think. I think uh, as soon as uh, COVID started, the entire museum world started to think, do we need all these exhibitions? And uh, do we need seven shows a year? So uh, I think a lot of uh, museum fo started to focus on their collection and then also not shipping too many works. And uh, probably that's one way to go. And uh, I also remember that a lot of uh, museum talked about we don't need a blockbuster show, and because well, because of the COVID, we needed to limit the number of people one time in a museum space. But then, as soon as COVID is like almost gone, like did we talk about uh, <laughs> this? Uh, when was it? It seems like people forget what we were discussing. And uh, uh, blockbuster show is all there, and uh, still sort of all these international shows had been planned. And uh, yeah, I think this is really the moment after experience of these three years. How do we, what do we continue? And uh, how do we sort of uh, go back to before three years? Well, how, what, what lesson did we learn? And for the sustainability of the museum, I think it's the whole, whole world is still needs to be discussed, that question. I'm gonna push that a little bit further. You're absolutely right, the question is important. I wonder what your answers are to that question. No, I think it's always the balance because there's no right answer. If there is a clear right answer, everyone is already doing it. So uh, all the museums are between uh, ethical management with the museum and then also the uh, exhibition making of with the limited funding, but also the museums are leaning so much on the tourism and the visitor number and so many percentage of our income is uh, coming from a ticket income. So everyone is sort of really trying to find a uh, fine balance between two polarities. 
and see where we stand. And then also, we are shifting our position from time to time so that uh, maybe one time we go for the large number uh, audience income generating show and then more sort of research based uh, specific topic it doesn't probably generate so many income so these these are sort of like uh, the ocean that we have been swimming <laughs> i think i think it really also depends on on where i mean the infrastructure of 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 you know of the con uh, for instance for us in 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 saudi uh, there is a thirst for you know exhibitions that are kind of um, people that are I would have to say they have to be large large scale as much as I would say they have to be people are thirsty to kind of learn more about contemporary art they're, they're thirsty to kind of really delve into the concept um, it kind of needs to have that dialogue we're not um, as much as I think COVID changed our perspective when it comes to um, exhibitions, uh, I think it also taught us that there are specific programs within these, you know, kind of, um, whether it's public programming or residency programs or et cetera, that we have to maybe focus on a little bit more or, or, um, or prolong them. So for instance, you can do something where it's, it's instead of it being like a, a one month, uh, I don't know, course or program, it can be rather than, you know, three months. If it's an exhibition, it can be curated differently in a way where it, it can fit more um, people, but done in a, you know, scenographically where there isn't, there is less kind of physical interaction when we were still in the transition phase from COVID to no COVID. I mean, you know, <laughs> um, so I think, but again, the infrastructure that we're, or the, or the ecosystem that we have still kind of like Mami was saying, once COVID was kind of, um, you know, drifting away, we ca we went back to our old habits and and f and maybe a little bit even more. I feel like there is there is a there is a like there is a stronger um, kind of this this thirst to learn and to really kind of uh, ask questions and 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 you know challenge a lot of the the curatorial concepts or or themes. So yeah. So I'm going to reference something that Aaron said earlier. Uh, Aaron, you said something like uh, COVID has in some ways been a uh, cover for Brexit. I, I don't know exactly how you phrased it, but something like that. I'll just put this out there. Is COVID for you a cover for a more deep structural change in the world and world order? And can we look through COVID and ask ourselves, has something significantly changed in the past three years? For instance, Nikita, you mentioned uh, the 1990s and how maybe the generation that is outside that long shadow of 1989 is different than the generation you started the museum for. Phil, you also mentioned that um, I, you guys know what I'm getting at, right? I, I, you know, yeah, I, so I, I'm, I, I'll just let you guys respond um, a, as you wish, if you wish. Um, um, actually, uh, this um, collective inquiry of three contested side uh, was um, really helped us to think about that the difference and what has changed over the past few decades and. Uh, and, and uh, through the research, we discovered that it's not just one, of course, it's not just one center. I'm sure this is the one major uh, transformation of we are talking about post-pandemic. It has to be many center. Um, and, but in the 1990s, when um, how art history or exhibition history was written, in the past 20 years, mainly focus on the center of this, uh, this uh, major cities, European cities, institutions, and maybe star curators, and also established artists. And then when we look back to the 90s, uh, all these forces of internationalization of contemporary art in China was actually not uh, uh, driven by only those centers. There are multiple forces, uh, including that in our research, we discover 
um, of course, uh, some of these European institutions in the 90s, they were uh, actually post-1989, they were in need of uh, changing their positioning and image, adapting to uh, the post-Cold War sign guidance and spirit. So they want to uh, present a different kind of, maybe a different frontier of contemporary art. And then there are also other forces like uh, ambassadors uh, and facilitators, uh, and they were genuinely enthusiastic about learning about learning about some other kind of culture. Of course, looking back, uh, it's this curiosity, and there are misunderstandings there. And also, there are actually non-human factors in the 90s, such as the emergence of email correspondence and international uh, uh, express service. And also there are these uh, vectors of lost artworks that show different tracks of trajectory, bridging art fair dealers, uh, museums and artists together. So all of this um, that we totally miss it from this globality of the 90s. So I think it's time for us after the pandemic to challenge uh, all this center and maybe there are more there we can dig out and we can probably gain uh, a certain energy or resonance or reverberance to, to bond and to heal and to revive again. Phil, would you like to respond? I mean, you mentioned uh, the rhyme between UCCA's founding and the Beijing Olympics as almost uh, an era. No, and, and the history Nikita speaks to is, is one that I think we, we grow out of and that at times grows out of very organically. Uh, it's a history that we, we traced in uh, this uh, exhibition I worked on at the Guggenheim in 2017. Um, which started in 1989 as kind of a big bang moment, you know, not just political upheaval, but the World Wide Web, uh, the post Cold War era, and kind of culminates in 2008. And now we're another, you know, zodiac cycle, and then some after that. And we start to ask, you know, what what is this world we inhabit? And and to your point, this three year hiatus, you participated actually as an artist in an, in an exhibition that we organized in 2020. Uh, the, at the moment the pandemic arrived, which was called Meditations in an Emergency that we curated during our very first lockdown. Um, you know, 26 artists from around the world responding to a totally unprecedented uh, situation. We, we thought it was gonna be over and we would go back to business as normal. We didn't quite anticipate that we would stay there for quite as long as we did. Um, but I think that those three years, you know, while they did shake our core understanding of ourselves as still being in that trajectory that we just talked about. They also forced us to kind of cook from the pantry, um, if you will, you know, really sort of look internally to see what our strengths were, what kinds of resources were there. For us, one of those strengths was something that we almost had been ashamed of, which is the ability to turn on a dime and do something very quickly. You know, as, a, as an institution in China that's constantly trying to be more professional and more mature and uh, to resemble more, you know, our our peers and and uh, models elsewhere, you know, to lengthen our exhibition timelines, we suddenly realized, wow, uh, to be able to throw together a show in six weeks is maybe, you know, a strength as much as it is a sign of, um, you know, Im immaturity or something like that. Um, and, and I think the other piece of that is that, you know, f suddenly being in a place where people weren't free to leave and come back. Um, you know, doing these blockbuster shows that you talk about or trying to, uh, we presented artists like Maurizio Catalan um, in, in 2021, you know, at the depth of the sort of walled off China policy. And suddenly there, here's this moment of kind of whimsical um, fancy for, for people who are otherwise stuck in, in, in a place that, you know, we're having to scan codes and, and all of that. So it was, um, And, and at, through all of that, you also had just the, no, the logical expansion of the audience, which is just a function of all the economic development that's happened also in this post-Cold War period, but finally reaching a point of accumulation where you have a significant concentration of people for whom going to an exhibition and you know, paying the equivalent of 10 or $15 to do that, it doesn't seem like a strange thing. And, and so we're actually weirdly the great beneficiaries of 
all of that development that happened before, even if it's not kind of happening as quickly now, but it take, there's a long lag in terms of, you know, consciousness and um, just practice and, uh, you know, how, how a society is structured, what kind of things people find inspiring or entertaining that we're suddenly able to reap. And that, that allows us, you know, like in sort of hedge fund language, like it sort of offsets um, all of these other instabilities and anxieties and tensions and, 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 and tightenings. I'm glad you uh, worked in hedge funds into this talk, uh, Phil. I'm joking. Um, okay, so I, I, absolutely um, uh, amazing I, I, what you say about um, uh, these past three years, um, um, thinking about uh, possibly not uh, mimicking or miming uh, models uh, from elsewhere, uh, museum models from elsewhere. And actually, I would love to direct this to Aya and also to Erin. Um, two observations. One, uh, the foundation is the youngest organization represented here, founded in 2020. So you genuinely had to think of what parts of the existing you know, world of museums or biennials you wanted to take and what parts you wanted to you know, reinvent or personalize. And Aaron, I would say Delfina is a atypical organization, uh, at, at least in terms of uh, those represented uh, on stage. So I'd also like to ask you to uh, speak about your unique strengths, Delfina's unique strengths. Uh, I think being the youngest foundation, it, it gives us a little bit of a privilege to learn from everybody else, you know, amazing institutions like Delfina or the UCCA or the Mori or you know the Times, a lot of a lot of these institutions have their own kind of f follow a sp specific uh, process, but also have their own, I would say like personality in a way. Um, for us, it's it's kind of the same. Being from a from a new, having this kind of young infrastructure, e kind of new ecosystem, trying to figure out where we are in terms of. Um, this understanding of contemporary art, the educational component of contemporary art, of the arts in general in Saudi Arabia, but also there is, especially with both biennials, they're so different because the contemporary biennial is a biennial that happens you know, in different places around the world and kind of depending on the theme. So for instance, Phil, you know, the, 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 the Feeling the Stones show kind of really um, touched on something so specific but so relatable at the same time internationally and locally that I feel like um, opened up this kind of conversation uh, with the world about, about what Saudi's trying to do and how we're trying to, you know, um, feel the stones. But with the Islamic biennial being the first of its kind in the world, it was, it was a, we're, we're, because we're a young foundation, we're also still learning. So we're learning in terms of, you know, what kind of visitor interaction we'll have with the Islamic biennial. Is it going to be, how do we make it very, um, interesting and different because it's 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 literally something that's never happened where you have contemporary works and objects um, in an airport <laughs> in in an, like an old you know Aga Khan award winning you know location but at the same time curated with four amazing curators uh, it's it's it, how do you kind of really um, make sure that the narrative is is interesting but correct at the same time and put and put together such a show. So we we're still learning till today. So now when we go back, we're this is our first time having the biennial in Ramadan, which is the fasting month, and we're gonna try to see even like you know how are people gonna are, are people gonna be coming more to the show because it's more of a spirit from a spiritual perspective. Are they gonna come to the show for you know to are they gonna be like a lot of recurring visitors or not? Or is it gonna be more family oriented or more kind of singular? So it's we're still learning in terms of so as a young foundation I think we have kind of these kind of both hands I would say. Yeah. I've had the pleasure to I've had the pleasure to attend both uh, biennials. Um, the one was curated by kind of Phil Tanara here and then the foursome who curated the um, Islamic art biennial. And I can kind of testify to the kind of rapid pace and growth that's happening in kind of Saudi Arabia. Um, 
And it's very interesting when you look at this in relation to kind of other parts of the world, other centers that are also kind of emerging. Um, in a sense that in Saudi, there's this incredible kind of ambition to kind of move fast. And it's, and it's a very young movement. It's a lot of young, particularly young women, who are at the head of a lot of these initiatives. And you can't help but be kind of caught up in their enthusiasm. And, and, and also all the, the worries that people will actually, will, this, will Saudi go back? Well, actually, if you go far forward, even if you come back two steps, which we all have done, even in the UK, we're going back many steps right now because of Brexit, <laughs> you'll still be further ahead. Um, but there's a much bigger question here, maybe we get to later about, well, if you are an emerging news center, do you need to replicate the models that are out there already? You know, and so when you talked about new museum paradigms, we actually, do new art centers need museums? Is there another way of thinking about how we kind of think about localism, how we um, nurture artistic practice? Does it have to be via residencies? Um, could you kind of break the mold and do something completely different? And I think when you are starting anew, you have kind of this kind of opportunity, especially when you're not, when the focus isn't on you just yet. You know, when you still are operating on the quote unquote periphery, when you can experiment, take risks, and eventually what you do there becomes recognized. And I, and I pulled up the Dhaka Art Summit as one kind of example of that. Um, it is a biannual kind of format of exhibitions, but they avoid the word biennial. And just that little gesture alone kind of, kind of marks them slightly out different from others because effectively in three years, in four years, in five years, they could wait and have another summit. It doesn't have to happen every two, every, every two, every two years. But what they've done kind of with the platform is really to work on a level that it has engaged um, artists who have a deep kind of social practice alongside those who we'd say have more of a, a fine art practice. And I think that kind of comes back to what you said earlier, Christopher, about some of the points that we raise here about artistic practice operating on the micro in opposition to what's happening on the macro. So when governments are trying to reinforce borders and, 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 and use um, racism and use outright lies to push forth a certain agenda, artists are trying to undermine that at every opportunity. And then I go back to the fact that, you know, we kind of sit in the center of London trying to, <laughs> you know, uh, un shake up kind of some of the thinking that's happening kind of around kind of our neighborhood. So I think that's probably one thing to answer your question that makes us maybe somewhat, okay, unique. Um, but possibly the other thing that really makes us kind of stand out. Um, and what would, I mean, that makes us, I think, connect mostly to our peers here is to try and really listen to artists and to try and reflect um, what they're thinking, to try and offer the kind of support that is needed. You know, so first and foremost, we are an artist-oriented organization. And our founder, Delfina, who passed away almost a, a, a year ago to this exact date, um, did not leave an endowment for the organization. Why? Because she didn't want it to memorialize her. She said, if it continues, it exists for a reason. There'll be other people to come in and step in to make it happen. Don't do it for me because I'll be fucking dead, is what she said. So as she cursed at every moment. Anytime I, have to, anytime I tell a story of Delfina, I have to use the word fuck. I'm really sorry. Um, so, and I think that kind of, again, <laughs> um, is that we are an organization that is kind of situated around kind of developing and nurturing artistic practice. So we have to be there listening to artists and supporting what's happening. Now to also connect to something else that was raised about, um, you know, when I mentioned that the pandemic was a cover for all the, the chaos that Brexit created, the pandemic also covered a technological revolution in a sense that we accepted Zoom and, you know, um, you know conversations online in a way that we never would have before. Even CNN was using like scratchy video coverage and bad sound of correspondence, right? If we ever had to Skype someone in before, we were terrified of the technology would fail. We've all accepted that, right? Okay, we all, we all hate Zoom now, we hate it, but we've accepted it. But we've gone a step further in terms of thinking about how we can connect kind of online. And these connections online means that you're also creating the possibilities for other centers and other to emerge because attention is not only in one location where people are physically gathered. And um, I think generally, um, as um, uh, in terms of my colleagues and, and, and what we're developing at Delfina Foundation is thinking about how we support kind of artists a lot more with technology. And because that is to me, you know, the next generation is going to be so kind of, you know, it already is kind of um, just so intuitive and so connected to them that we have to kind of respond to some of these things that happened in a pandemic. Like 
NFTs, which we're all going to, of course, don't want to speak about because we all hate them. They're market oriented, generated, you know, but, you know, it's a thing that happened, right? And so, uh, how do we respond to this? I threw a lot of stuff out there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, maybe, first of all, why do we need to replicate what other centers have? <laughs> That's my question back to Christopher. I'm taking over the moderation. Chris, what, what would you say? To, what's your response to that question? How about this? I'll bounce it to the audience. <laughs> um, um, I actually mean that. Uh, we have about 30 minutes left, uh, and we will continue the conversation uh, up here, but uh, I will um, periodically also open it up to questions for the audience uh, from here on out. So this is one of those moments. Are there any questions so far? Uh, to our uh, panelists from the uh, second row. Hi, thank you so much for the speakers. Um, and Aaron, just to your last point about you know technology, NFTs, and all that. Actually, and and also with you know previous speakers talking about decentralization and new museum models. Um, for me, I actually work in the tech industry. And I feel like there's definitely a misunderstanding and misalignment in terms of what blockchain technology can do in cultural, in the cultural sector. And there's a lot of, and, and I think NFT or what we currently perceive as NFTs is only really just on the surface of what's available and its possibilities and different things we can do, you know, in terms of preservation, engagement, community building, and speaking to a new generation of audiences. So would love to hear actually different speakers sharing their thoughts on new museum models and decentralization and how technology, as you mentioned, can help support artists and the whole art ecosystem. Thank you. I think that's a great question. Phil? I, well, you know, one thing that we, we did during the pandemic was to really look at how we interact with our audience digitally. And of course, in China, the channels are, are different and uh, the, the disconnect between those and the, the channels and platforms used elsewhere in the world kind of grows greater and greater as this divergence continues. Um, but it really, I mean, so what did we do? We, we redid our, our mini program, which is an app that lives inside of WeChat, which is the only platform that realistically matters day to day. Um, and made it into a place where we are able to interact with the people who come to visit us, to enhance their experience while they're on site, um, to deliver them contact both while they're uh, content while they're at UCCA and, and beyond, to to connect our you know we're we're in three cities we're Beijing, Shanghai, and then by the sea and Beidaihe, um, so to have all of the exhibitions and all of the programs kind of in one place. Um, to buy tickets, to become a member, like all that kind of stuff, to 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 track down talks that might have happened. Um, and then ultimately, maybe this can help us to build more of a community and to, to stay in a kind of constant um, state of connection with, with our audience. We also decided to take some time to really figure out who this audience was, and the results were really incredible. I mean, first of all, it's 70% female. It's 80% 45 and under. Um, 40% so 80% with a BA or higher and 40% with a master's or higher, which is just like kind of shocking. Um, but um, I think it's also, you know, wanting to know that and speak to that and interact with that, but also it's a balance in terms of understanding why people come to us, which is because we have some kind of judgment or some kind of sense of what might be worth their time. And if we don't have that, then we, we have no value. So it's it's kind of being led by and being sensitive to the audience, but also, you know, kind of dialogically, but still firmly kind of pushing forward a, an agenda in terms of what kinds of themes and issues and artists and positions um, should be brought to people's attention. I, had, I saw the most amazing show at the Mori last month, uh, Rapongi Crossing, where you know, mommy had a team of curators that just went head on into all of these discourses um, that are circling the art world now in all these different ways. And it was just, I was so, I was telling her the other day, like it was amazing to me just because these are the kinds of conversations that are actually not the ones being had in, in China right now. I think uh, in terms of your question, I think I had been 
asking that question to myself a lot during these three years. But I think uh, as a museum who has this physical space, then we have to find a meaning of having uh, this physical space. So uh, some of the things that we also realized that we did a lot of digital program, but uh, there are so many things that it doesn't go beyond the screen. Uh, so this uh, sort of scale, like now we are meeting with people in person. Oh, I didn't know you were so tall. Oh, I didn't know you were so skinny. So like this kind of the sense of scale doesn't come beyond the screen. And then also this materiality doesn't come beyond the screen. So uh, we did the show called uh, uh, the Listen to the Sound of the Earth Turning, uh, referring to the Yoko Ono's poetry, that uh, uh, it's really for the people to come and actually see the work in the physically and then also the like uh, immersive installation of with the certain scale so that people really feel that the meaning of coming to the museum but at the same time I believe that uh, the, a lot of new uh, technologies are coming into art making or image making so all these generation who are born for instance maybe uh, late 80s that the, the way of making images are really coming from uh, computer game and uh, like game space making. So all these things are quite fascinating to me. But uh, I think uh, what museum needs to do is always not about reactioning to the new trend, but it has to be uh, contextualizing historically where we are. So we could really look at how this technology had been changing the art making over the course of the years. So this is only the moment that it looks like radically changing. But I think these radical changes have been always there. And uh, if you look at the uh, uh, first chapter of the catalog essay of any shows, it always starts technology had been changing and information technology had sort of broadened our communication, even from 60s and 70s, the same beginning. So that uh, I think uh, how do we respond to these new technologies always how we sort of have a distance from where we are and having a broader view time-wise and also um, the geographically. To be just really super quick is to say that, you know, so Delfina Foundation is predominantly a residency space for artists. It's a place where we're experimenting and taking risks. A lot of my colleagues who run residencies, unless they're a specialist in like digital arts, if they're not, they're nowhere near even considering kind of engaging in that kind of way. We really do want to, but in order to do it, we need a partner who has the resources, either financially or technologically, in order to kind of create kind of uh, and, and create opportunities to for artists to experiment with the technology. So that's where we are, trying to like step into that space, um, but we're not fearful of it at all, like many of our other colleagues are. So. I actually want to respond to Mami's um, comment um, because uh, this rapid uh, changes, I mean technology discussion has always been there because when, uh, as I mentioned, when we look back to the 90s that we noticed by the end of the 1990s that museums started to have an email address but one museum only has one email address. To, can you imagine, <laughs> like, how do you, as curators or directors, how do you communicate? How, I mean, when we think of, of course, that change, how we think of speed and time. Um, and now when we think about producing exhibition or running an, an institution that you only have one email address <laughs> to communicate. Um, so that, that and, and if you look back, so that must, ha that must have changed curatorially and also how artists like communicate with the public. So it has always been there. And also now when we are working on this ongoing research of uh, three contested side, we heavily rely on technology. Like we use Notion, this kind of app, and now just uh, Chris mentioned this morning, we have tons of uh, interview that have not been transcribed. So now with AI, <laughs> we can do that uh, instantly. Like so, but but thinking about the public as well uh, as a few mentioned that uh, in China, I mean, museum public are very educated, very young, and mostly women. And if as a metaphor, uh, contemporary, I think is also a coded language. 
So that, uh, that is similar, I think, to technology. And, and if this public uh, are, like, they, they enjoy, they enjoy contemporary art, they are attracted by museum, uh, maybe different kind of project, that means they are already in this context. Maybe we're not really there as uh, the mission of museum, not really presenting cutting edge technology per se, but again, contextualize, what does that mean? I mean, what, what will be the really deep changes or transformation of our life and how do we uh, use technology and to, to bridge the friends and uh, navigate the multipolar world, I think, go back to our theme. Are there any other questions uh, for now from the audience? Can I ask Aaron more about this hood politics project? Because hood is also, many people post Instagram your hood, but you can never taste it. So if it could be, could look good, but could taste really bad. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Um, so now I actually get to a virtual version of what we do call family lunch. But um, yeah, so we started in 2014, almost 10 years ago, a whole program called The Politics of Food. And I mentioned it very briefly earlier because it marked a shift in our work from working geographically with the Middle East and North Africa to working internationally with artists around common practices and common themes. And we recognize at that point uh, that a lot of... Um, well, artists throughout history, of course, work with food, but in that particular moment, and the, the region in which we were um, uh, engaging most with, the Middle East, was undergoing um, kind of rapid changes, partly because of what is the, called the quote-unquote Arab Spring, um, which started when a fruit and vegetable salesman set himself on fire in Tunisia, you know, which sparked, sparked the Jasmine Revolution, which then moved over to Cairo, which then, you know, continued into Syria, which became the civil war. And food was at the center of all of these protests. In the case of Syria, it was used as a pawn by the government um, to, yeah, rationing to punish communities. And to this day, there's still issues around that. Then the Arab Spring inspired the Occupy movements um, on Wall Street that then also went global, where food justice and um, uh, the pricing of food, the autonomy of farmers were part of the demands of the Occupy kind of Wall Street movement. And in the UK, we also had the horse meat scandal, which was when a lot of people discovered that within their sausages and whatever was more than beef or pork. It was also horse. Um, so all these things were happening where people were questioning kind of the food chain and artists were already engaging with communities in many different ways through artist farms and, and other initiatives. And so we tried to create a program that would collect a lot of this, these sort of initiatives that were happening on a local level and use uh, a shared platform for discovery and exploration through activities that would happen in London. So over the last 10 years, we've had about 120 residencies around this theme, the politics of food, using food both as a metaphor and medium to discuss some of the world's kind of challenging issues, but on a local level and also looking at recipes and culinary practices as, uh, as part of cultural memory. Um, let's, let's kind of define it that way. And um, going back to kind of like what kind of Mammy is talking about, kind of Instagram and, 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 and kind of how people engage with food over, over technology and, and that aspect. Um, for every two or three weeks, we do something at Delphina called Family Lunch, um, which there were some images that came up on the screen, which is a good representation of our work and that is very, it's, it's a convivial, a very um, uh, domestic and hospitable experience, but at its core is creating a, a table for people to come together to eat, to share food, but to also share ideas. Of course, during the pandemic, we couldn't gather in such a way. So we went online and we invited artists to do virtual family lunches from their own homes. And at that point, I think we realized just how big the network of Delphina Foundation has been. We've had artists from 85 different countries all over the world. So these virtual family lunches really became kind of platforms for artists to report from where they were located about what was happening during the pandemic. So we had Yuji from Shanghai. We had um, 
Renan from Indonesia. We had um, uh, Leon Contini from Italy. And, you know, and in Europe, Italy was like the hotspot, right? When everything kind of happened for the, for the pandemic. So we had our artists kind of speaking about kind of their practice and place from these places that were undergoing kind of uh, the most brutal kind of lockdowns. Um, they also gave a recipe, so then people went home and cooked them at home. Um, so there's still this kind of fun and convivial kind of kind of aspect to, to to what we do. But again, going back to the reach of Delfina Foundation, it was also at that moment that we realized how much responsibility to we have to our family, to this network that we've fostered through the politics of food, but also through all of our other residencies, and that there is not a single forest fire, military coup or earthquake that doesn't affect someone in our network. And so there's a lot of work that we do behind the scenes that you'll never see in these images of just supporting our family, of trying to ensure that everyone's safe, that everyone has resources that are required, um, whether they're trying to, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, there's many different examples I don't want to give because I also give a people's pr private kind of situation. Um, but um, I'm not sure there's a big, and also going back to Mary, <laughs> <laughs> that was some way an answer to the politics of food, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, actually, we also did uh, the food project over the uh, COVID time. Then it ended up as an artist cookbook. Now I was happy to see that book at the M Plus uh, Museum Shop. That we started to ask uh, artists, uh, what are you doing? What are you cooking? Can you send me a recipe? Then we used uh, social media because Moriart Museum has a very strong social media audience. So uh, the Instagram, Twitter, and uh, the Facebook overall, we have s more than 600,000 uh, followers. So uh, I asked the different artists to send the, what they're cooking and then recipe and also with the little stories so that it, uh, during, during the pandemic time and lockdown time it really felt that uh, someone is there they're doing eating and living so it's also just checking up if they are alive <laughs> I think uh, I think when it comes to food for from from our end I think food is the center, I think, of culture, or the core of culture. For, for us, you know, in 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 Saudi, and in, in Jeddah especially, because of because it's the kind of the gateway um, to going to Mecca and Medina. A lot of people used to travel, you know, um, and and stay in in Jeddah for a long time. So while you know, and they and when they would reside in in local in locals' homes for for months. So they would teach each other, you know. You know different kinds of foods. They would trade. They would sell things to each other. It's 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 an interesting kind of relationship. But food is a, is kind of the the main component. So it became like a melting pot. Um, so in a normal kind of in a normal um, table in in especially in a Jeddah uh, family or or from our our part, um, you would find things that are kind of more. You'd find a little bit more of like an Asian. Um, uh, something, uh, you know, we have a lot of like Turkish, we have a lot of um, Egyptian kinds of foods. We have, it's, it's, and we kind of also transformed them in our own way. So you have that taste, but you also have a different kind. So if you go to Egypt, you won't have the same exact, <laughs> the same exact dish. It'll be something inspired by, but it is, it, it, and it becomes more of like a, a diet. So when you sit on a table, it's a normal conversation. Say, oh, is this the Egyptian way or the Lebanese way or the Turkish way or the, you know, is this, is this dish? more oh because my grandmother is 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 Lebanese I I taught I know I was learned I learned how to do this this way oh and my father is from this you know so it becomes kind of a it's always a conversation around food when it comes to these things and I think yeah I did a lot of research or well, we did some research around this at Delfina Foundation because we did a collaboration with Art Jamil in Saudi yeah. and so looking at all of that in fact their inaugural show was uh, a show that we co-curated kind of uh, with them. But I was also really taken to see the, how the Islamic Biennale mm. had also incorporated kind of the notion of food and breaking f you know, fast. Yeah. And, and also with this incredible kind of dining table by Lubna Chowdhury, Lubna. Yes. which yes. Moza al uh, yes. did her, her residency at Delfina right before she came to produce that a performance with the bread, the, the breaking, breaking the bread, bread. Yes, yes, yes. At, in, in Saudi. And then we had someone else come in and, um, who's a writer about food, um, and she came in and basically people were gathered around the table, had different kinds of food from different places around the world, and everybody was kind of experimenting, like kind of like a playing a guessing game. Where do you think this food came from? Why do you think these two combinations happened? So there is a very famous 
um, thing we eat. It's 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 beans with with bread. It's called full and tamiz. But it actually became full and tamiz together in Saudi. It's not eaten that way in other parts of the world. So someone ate, you know, brought a piece of bread from that's actually. Um, originally eaten a lot in Pakistan, and ful, which is also something that's eaten a lot in Egypt, and combined them and ma made them like a very important kind of marriage, I would say, <laughs> in, our, in our tables. Um, I will try to make a joke here about <coughs> fusion food and um, <laughs> multipolarities. Actually, I will not. Um, Go on, try, try, Go ahead. let's do it. <laughs> it's gonna be really bad. But what I do appreciate about this discussion um, uh, today, not just about food, is that we really, as Stephanie introduced the panel, spoke about a very, very big topic, multipolarity. And I think throughout this conversation, all of you have pointed to more intimate uh, settings, like the dining room table or like the classroom. And my sense is that perhaps the very bigness of this topic um, is one that we should approach, to, to use the, the analogy that Nikita used earlier, um, from the ground up uh, rather than from the top down. And for me, that is the takeaway of uh, this, this conversation. Um, I would like to thank all of you very, very much. I know this is a busy week. All of you have packed schedules. Thank you so much for taking the time to share with each other and with our audience members uh, your thoughts and uh, your organizations. Thank you. Thank you.